Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, and as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition 44 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of February, uh, what is it, the 16th to the 22nd, 2012. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things that are important to me and I think deserve your attention. Uh, any reactions to the show can be sent to me directly. My email address is hoviating, it's w-h-o-v-i-a-t-i-n-g at aol.com. And if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around there somewhere during the course of the show. And uh, you can get the email address from there. The one thing I ask is that if you do email me, you include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam. Okay, with all of that business out of the way, on to today's show. And it turns out that um, hypocrisy of uh, various sorts from various quarters and various parts of the political spectrum is something of a theme today. So we're going to start with some religious hypocrisy. Part of the new so-called health reform law, and um, I'll interject that I call it so-called because I was one of those people who didn't like this law because I thought it wasn't good enough, didn't go far enough, but uh, that's, a, that's an argument for another time. But part of this health reform law requires insurance to provide coverage for preventive care with no co-pays. That is, the insurance covers the cost completely. And uh, now you surely know about the rending of garments and gnashing of teeth on the part of the U.S. Catholic bishops and their right-wing wannabe allies over the decision to include, to include birth control as a preventative care. Uh, now the proposal, the original proposal, excluded uh, directly religious employers like the Catholic Church itself, but did not uh, exclude employers of religiously affiliated organizations like a Catholic church or a Catholic university. I mean a Catholic hospital rather, or a university. Well, the bishops started screaming that this was an attack on religious freedom and even an attack on religion, which interestingly meant that the Catholic bishops are arguing that Catholic doctrine is equal to the definition of religion, which is a pretty revealing comment. But le leaving that aside, uh, the more important thing here was that um, this, these arguments were eagerly seconded by the um, reactionary right, which pretty much is equal to the Republican Party these days. Um, they, were, they were dreaming of all of these Catholic voters they were going to get as the result of joining in the screeching. Well, the White House responded with what's been generally described as a tweak of the regulations. Uh, they put the burden for covering uh, contraceptive care on the insurance companies rather than on the um, employers, in any case where the employer could claim a genuine religious objection. All right, was that a reasonable compromise? Well, considered in isolation, apart from everything else, sure, it was reasonable. To the women, it's invisible. It's still covered with no copay. Um, and if they were dealing with reasonable people, that would be the end of it. But out in the real world, they're not dealing with reasonable people. And of course, that wasn't the end of it. Which means it was actually a terrible idea. First, because repeated polls have shown that a majority of Americans and an even bigger majority of Catholics approved of the original policy. Um, and what this does is it proves yet again that Barack Obama really is not capable of standing up to the right wing. He's great at standing up to the left. He's great at thumbing his nose at those to the left of him as, as nothing but whiners. But he most times has no stomach for a fight with the right. In the face of all their blathering and blustering, he compromised even when a majority of people were on his side. Second, this of course did nothing to appease the bullies. The uh, New York Archbishop Timothy Dolan, he's actually the head of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, he dismissed the change as nothing more than a first step in the right direction and later derided it as a hill of beans. The conference itself responded by demanding a complete surrender, a complete revocation of coverage of birth control. They argued the decision to ensure that women have ac uh, access to contraceptives, quoting, remains a grave moral concern. The Goppers in Congress chimed in. They want to pass legislation um, that would allow 
any employer to deny birth control coverage uh, to any employee if that coverage runs counter to their religious or moral objections or apparently if they in any other way find the whole idea icky. Why can't the White House get it through its head that um, bullies can't be appeased? Backing up only encourages them to step forward, which is exactly what they did. There are three things, three things that we need to make clear here. First, we have to remember this is not about abortion. This is about birth control. Uh, the Catholic Church is saying it should have the legal right to interfere with the ability of any of its employees to obtain birth control. Interfere because you're making it cost more if it's not covered, which means it has to be paid for out of pocket. Um, and for some time, abortion rights advocates, advocates of choice, have been saying the real issue isn't abortion, it's birth control. That's the real bottom line, birth control, because it's anything that gives women autonomy over their own bodies. The church has now proven that contention beyond any reasonable doubt. I mean, you'd figure, wouldn't you, that the church would be in favor of contraception. The more contraception, the fewer unwanted babies. The fewer unwanted pregnancies, the fewer abortions. But you'd be wrong if you thought that. The real opposition, both from the Catholic Church and, and, the, and the much of the right wing, is to anything that can make women be other than baby factories. All right, second thing to remember. We're not talking about church employees here, okay? We are talking about church-affiliated institutions. In many cases, the people who would be affected by this are not Catholic. The church, in essence, is demanding the right to impose its religious beliefs on its employees regardless of theirs. If being Catholic is not a job requirement, if holding to Catholic doctrine or Catholic ideology is not part of the job description, then it cannot, it must not, logically it should not be a condition for any health insurance that's available to you as an employee. Right, and finally, third, the gorilla in the room. And this is just the latest instance. I'm quoting from a news article here. The bankruptcy hearings for the Archdiocese of Milwaukee have revealed more than 8,000 previously unreported cases of alleged sexual abuse of children, according to one attorney representing the victims. The charges cover a span of 60 years and implicate a group of 100 alleged offenders, including nuns, church workers, and some 75 priests. 570 victim survivors have already filed claims in the case. I'm going to quote something, a source that I would assume the Catholic Church is familiar with, the Bible. This is actually from the King James Version, Matthew 7, verses 1 to 5. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And what measurement you meet, it shall be meted against you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, and considerest not the beam that's in thine own eye? Or wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull the mote out of thy eye, while, uh, while behold, a beam is in your own eye? Thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam from thine own eye, then you will be able to see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. In this case, a beam, by the way, in case you don't understand, is like a wood beam, like a rafter. The Catholic Church in this country, the church hierarchy in this country, doesn't have a single beam in its eye, it's got a whole barn's worth. The Catholic Church hierarchy in this country, quite frankly, is not in a position to make moral judgments about the behavior of anybody else. And their opinion on this matter should be completely and totally ignored. Okay, from there, I'm going to move on to our usual weekly feature, the outrage of the week. Now, first, I have to give a footnote to um, last week's uh, Outrage of the Week. That referred to a report by the Bureau for Investigative Journalism that documents hundreds of civilians, uh, civilian deaths uh, due to the U.S., which really means the CIA, uh, drone attacks in Pakistan. That included cases of deliberate attacks on rescue workers and funerals. It turns out that the New York Times story I quoted in the course of that, uh, that piece may have been the only mainstream reference to this report in the United States. 
a study by, a, by a, um, a media watchdog group called FAIR, a review of news databases shows only that, that story, a story at antiword.com and a story on Democracy Now! So add to the outrage, you can add the fact that this story was ignored, if not actively suppressed, by our oh-so-self-righteously independent news media. All right, but this week, though, this week, we're going to consider the story of one Harold Wayne Hadley Jr. He's 19 years old. He's a straight-A student at Jones County Junior College in Ellisville, Mississippi. Recently, he was sitting in the men's room in the school library. He was doodling on some toilet paper, and he wrote, I passed a bomb in the library. Which, in a rational world, anyone finding that note in the men's room on a piece of toilet paper would know he meant he passed gas. It's not a rational world. Someone found this note, gave it to a teacher who recognized Hadley's handwriting, and all hell broke loose. Eleven emergency agencies responded to the school, but of course, there was no bomb. And what I frankly expect was uh, an attempt to, you'll pardon the pun, cover their asses about this insane overreaction. Officials had Hadley arrested, held on $20,000 bail, facing prosecution for a charge of threatening to blow up the school. If it's convicted, he faces 10 years in prison and a $10,000 fine. Our paranoia is now so deep and so ingrained that Hadley is faced with 10 years in prison for a fart joke. I mean, that sounds insane. That sounds incredible. It sounds ridiculous. And it is. Which is why it's the outrage of the week. And uh, we're going to take a break. We'll be back in about 10 seconds. And we're back, which is pretty obvious, I suppose. Okay, next up, I got another story of hypocrisy. And again, it's one that you may not have heard of. Uh, maybe you did. The story started circulating late last summer, but I have to admit, I wasn't aware of it till recently, and it is something that's ongoing. Okay, the Mujahideen Hel Kalk, or the Warriors of God, normally known by its initials, M-E-K, the M-E-K, it's an Iranian group that's on the State Department's list of foreign terrorist organizations. Now, it's more like a cult than a movement. It has a central fantasy of overthrowing the government of Iran, but it's marked by a by complete devotion to the leaders of the group uh, named Maryam and Masoud Rajavi, the former of who apparently regards herself as the legitimate president of Iran. A recent report on NBC News quotes two American officials as saying MEK was behind the string of murders of Iranian nuclear scientists that have occurred since 2010, the most recent of which occurred in January. Now, whatever you think about this group in particular, or the State Department list in general, the fact remains that providing material support to such a group is a felony. Uh, and in fact, a number of people have been charged and convicted under material support charges on exactly that basis, despite having only the most tenuous connection to any actual terrorist group. I'm going to give you just a couple of recent examples. In 2009, a satellite TV salesman on Staten Island was sentenced to five years in federal prison because he included a Hezbollah TV channel on the satellite package he sold to customers. Last July, a 22-year-old ex-Penn State student named Emerson Winfield Begley he was indicted for posting comments on a jihadist internet, a jihadist internet forum, uh, one of which was interpreted as uh, praising shootings at a Marine Corps base. In September, Jabbar Ahmad, a 24-year-old Pakistani legally living in Virginia, was indicted for a five-minute YouTube video in which he criticized U.S. policy in the Muslim world. The basis for the charge is that he supposedly had talked about this video beforehand with the son of a leader of one of these groups. On December 20th, Tarak Mahana of Sudbury was convicted of material support on terrorism for posting pro-jihadist material, printed material, on the internet. 
One person was actually acquitted of these charges. His name was Sami Omar al Hussein. Um, he's a Saudi Arabian grad student. He was charged with giving material support to terrorists because he maintained a website which had links to other sites that were jihadist. Now, how far can this go? Pretty far. Pretty far. The Humanitarian Law Project, a couple of years ago, wanted to advise the um, Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, which is on, again, on the State Department list, wanted to advise them on how to file human rights complaints at the UN and to conduct peace negotiations with the Turkish government. In other words, the Humanitarian Law Project wanted to advise the PKK on alternatives to terrorism. In June of 2010, the Supreme Court ruled that the government could ban that activity as material support to terrorists on the grounds that the government's interest in uh, denying the group's legitimacy outweighed any constitutional considerations. Put another way, the court found that the government could have a legitimate interest, an interest grave enough to, over, to, to, to overrule any constitutional considerations, a legitimate interest in preventing terrorist groups from learning about alternatives to terrorism. Now, why am I going through all this history? All right, this is why. A number of prominent political figures from both major parties, including Michael McKenzie, Andrew Card, Tom Ridge, Rudy Giuliani, Howard Dean, Ed Rendell, Ed Rendell rather, Bill Richardson, and Wesley Clark, have been paid tens of thousands of dollars by the MEK to give speeches advocating their cause. The MEK is again on this list of foreign terrorist organizations maintained by the State Department. Now, not only have these people been paid money by the MAK to, give, to advance its cause and to try to get it removed from the list of terrorist groups, they've openly acknowledged repeatedly meeting with leaders of that group. Now, based on those other cases, how much more obvious could material support of a terrorist group be? I mean, especially considering that in the Humanitarian Law Project case, the Supreme Court ruled that even peaceful... Uh, e even peaceful advocacy on behalf of a group was criminal if it was done in coordination with the group. And these people are not only being paid by the group, they're meeting with the group's leaders. What do you need for coordination? I mean, what possible, based on those other cases, what possible justification is there for Rudy Giuliani, uh, Howard Dean, and the rest to be walking around free, collecting their fat terrorist paychecks, making speeches, going on TV, going to their fancy parties, parties and all the rest, while people you never heard of face years in prison for doing far less? Question answers itself. People you never heard of. They're the ones who are investigated. They'll be indicted. They'll be prosecuted. They'll be sent to prison. But Tom Ridge? Wesley Clark? I mean, the very idea of prosecuting such well-connected, important people is unthinkable. It can't be broached. I mean, people in authority wouldn't even think of it. It wouldn't occur to them to prosecute these people. Now, note well, I'm not saying that Rudy Howard, Tom Wesley, and all the rest of the gang should be in prison. I'm saying those other people shouldn't be. But be that as it may, it's hard to imagine anything that could point up more clearly the corruption at the heart of our supposed justice system. The unknown go to prison, the elite go to parties. Now this is not new, okay? It's not new. Uh, there are a number of variations on the image of the law as being like a spider's web that can catch the little fly by which a bird can smash right through. And some of those references go back to ancient Greece. But that doesn't make it any the less corrupt. And there's one more thing about this. That same NBC News report I mentioned at the beginning of this item quoted those two officials as saying the MEK is financed, trained, and armed by Israel's Secret Service. Which by definition would make Israel a state sponsor of terrorism. But that's okay, it seems causes no upset in our halls of power. Because, you see, the MEK's terrorism is aimed at Iran. So in addition to everything else, Giuliani and the rest are safe because they're working for the good terrorists, the terrorists who are on our side, the terrorists whose terrorism is good terrorism because we don't like the people these terrorists intend to terrorize. How much more corrupt 
can it be? All right, going to move on now to an occasional feature. That occasional feature that I've that uh, sometimes comes up here. It's called everything you need to know. Uh, in this case, it's everything you need to know in two sentences about how the right wing thinks of you. There is a proposal going around that would do an end run around the Electoral College uh, and ensure that the person who wins the popular vote in the presidential election actually wins the election. The right wing is against this proposal because they regard direct popular election of the president as mob rule. And that is everything you need to know. All right, finally, on another sort of hypocrisy. This is one of valuing political expediency, a party loyalty over human rights and basic decency. Now that sounds like it could be a run-of-the-mill denunciation of the right, and it could be, but in this case, it's not. During the Bush years, liberal Democrats and supposedly progressive activists screamed, and legitimately so, about how George Bush, or Shrub, was uh, undermining American values and shredding the Constitution. Barack Obama, President Hopi Changey himself, campaigned on just how awful all that was and how he was going to change all that. And this just wasn't a plank in his platform. This was a central theme of the entire thing. But once in office, he abandoned all that and went back on almost everything he said in the matter. His administration not only endorsed the Bush regime's arguments on how national security trumps everything else, it went beyond it. He's refused to prosecute Bush administration criminalities, even in the face of admissions by Bush and the big Dick Cheney that they authorized torture. He's expanded executive power. He's broadened claims justifying official secrecy. He pushed for renewal of provisions of the Traitor Act, the Patriot Act, I call it the Traitor Act. He's intensified the secret and illegal drone war in Pakistan. He's expanded the ability of the government to electronically uh, eavesdrop on our communications. He's given the FBI wider powers to poke, prod, and pry into our privacy. He's waged an unprecedented war in whistleblowers. He's sought to destroy WikiLeaks, and he's allowed the torture of Bradley Manning. And sometimes these extensions of individual, even monarchical powers are uh, even more shocking than that. In the case of Libya, for example, Obama not only ignored the War Powers Act, he deliberately thumbed his nose at the very idea that Congress could have any say on when, how, why, or even if American military forces are deployed. In essence, he said, it's my Air Force and I'll do whatever I want with it. He's endorsed the power of presidents to imprison anyone, including American citizens taken on American soil, imprison them indefinitely, without charge, without trial, without any legal rights whatsoever. Based solely on that president's unchallengeable claim that the person was in some way connected to terrorism. Oh, but by the way, don't worry, Howard Dean's safe. He doesn't have to worry about this. He's also declared for himself the power of extra, to order the extrajudicial murder of anyone, including American citizens, anywhere in the world on exactly that same sort of unchallengeable claim. And at the same time, he's refused to reveal whatever legal authority has been invented by his administration to give himself that power. But again, Rudy Giuliani's safe, don't worry about him. And how has all that been treated by far too much of what passes for the left in this country? Beyond a few quiet grumbles about how, well, there might be some legitimate criticism, it's been basically silence. Silence demonstrated by a recent poll, a Washington Post, ABC News. According to that poll, 77% of self-identified liberal Democrats endorse the use of drones in Pakistan and elsewhere. They endorse the secret illegal CIA war. Um, Fifty-five percent still approve of such attacks, even when the targets are specifically identified as American citizens. What about that symbol of, of Bush-era undermining of the Constitution, Guantanamo Bay? In February 2009, shortly after Obama was inaugurated, and at a time it was, it was talked about he was going to close the, plan, the, the, the place, the, the Pew Research did a poll that found 64% of Democrats approved of that decision. I think we can assume that the percentage of liberal Democrats was even higher. But in that new Washington Post ABC News poll, 53% of liberal Dems now support Obama's decision to keep it open. 
This is more evidence, of, if it, any, any evidence was needed, of hypocrisy on a grand scale. A scale that envelops an entire political party and even, and even more importantly, envelops far too many people who denounce the immorality and illegality of the shrub years, but now find the chant of elect more Democrats drowns out the whisper of conscience. Evidence says that for a large segment of what passes for the left in this country, that old right-wing charge that their opposition to Bush was based on political expediency and not commitment is actually true. These, I agree with Glenn, Glenn Greenwald who said uh, that these people, these, these hypocrites, these trimmers whose morality depends upon whether or not the president has a D or an R after his name do not deserve to be listened to. They do not deserve to be believed the next time when, quoting him, they want to pretend to oppose civilian slaughter and civil liberties assaults when perpetrated by the next Republican president. Greenwald notes also that 35% of liberal Democrats say they oppose Obama's policies of the sort of run through here. And while that is, he says, a non-trivial amount, it still makes us a majority of liberals who are themselves are minor a, a minority of the country. We are, we are a minority of a minority. And yet somehow we must still struggle on. We've got to keep trying. There's a reason that my blog is subtitled um, Surviving a Dark Time. Far too many people believed or have convinced themselves that that darkness lifted in January 2009. They were wrong. Okay, there's so much I've been wanting to talk about. So much I just haven't had the time. I want to talk about Egypt. I want to talk about Syria. I haven't talked Occupy in weeks. I do want to get this one thing in about Occupy. A couple of weeks ago, just before the Florida primary, Newt Gingrich accused Witless Romney of being a tool of Wall Street and said that he, Grinch, would keep Goldman Sachs from rigging the game. The fact that he had to use that kind of language shows you something's going on. All right, I am just about out of time. There's still so much more to talk about. Um, I will see you in a week. Uh, you just have the best week you possibly can. And, um, well, we'll see you next week. <laughs>